You're listening to a podcast from digitaloilgas.com. This podcast is entitled Five Clever Digital Technologies for Oil and Gas. Digital technology is advancing at a great pace, but which technologies could have an outsized impact on the oil and gas sector, particularly the high-cost oil sands projects? Canada is a technologically advanced nation, and we're facing some pretty tough challenges at the moment, all the right conditions for technology adoption. So here's my thoughts on five clever technologies with a place in the future of the industry. But if there's one criticism of technology advocates, me included, is that technology tends to go looking for a problem to solve. Why not start with the problems of the industry and work backwards to identify the most interesting technologies? Well, here's problem number one is vast distances. The one truly staggering feature of unconventional oil and gas fields is the immense size of the resources. For example, the accumulative land area of the Athabasca, Cold Lake, and Peace River oil sands field is 140,000 square kilometers, which is about the size of England. Imagine building a road network, oil and gas wells, mines, flow lines, telecommunications, processors, and a power grid across a small country. Now try to grow constantly for two decades and maintain all the accumulating immensity of it at hopefully a declining cost. So, what technologies can impact this tremendous cost and logistics problem? Second problem is getting people off out of the field and off the road. When oil, gas, oil and gas prices were high, we could make good coin even with high-cost people. Now, not so much. Unconventional resource plays need to spend a huge amount of time and money moving expensive people and equipment around, sometimes to the distress of local communities. Getting people off the roads and out of the fields as much as possible, substituting technology for people, is key. So, what technologies can replace some of the work of people, building stuff, delivering things, providing services, repairing and maintaining kit, or can move that work to a place where people are more conveniently located? And number three is flexibility of the workforce. The skill level required to maintain oil and gas wells, pumping equipment, processing plants, uh, pipelines, and facilities is demanding. Over time, engineers will simplify the oil and gas kit to make it easier to work with, but in the meantime, augmenting workforce skills and helping them stay locally resident will really help. So, what technologies can help someone unfamiliar with a task or asset be quickly and safely competent? So, with those as the problems, here's five technologies worth watching against these key challenges of distance, logistics, complexity, people shortages, and demanding skill sets. Number one is autonomy. Robotic cars are already proving to be much safer than human drivers, more reliable, and with lower operating costs. But imagine the positive impact of driverless technology on the logistics problem and the cost of building out oil and gas infrastructure. Building a well requires dozens of trips by light and heavy-duty trucks to the drill site to inspect, plan, and execute the work. Same thing for well workovers, repairs and maintenance, and plug and abandonment. Another autonomous vehicle with great promise is of the aerial variety. Drones can fly at night so as not to spook the neighbors, inspect oil and gas fields far more efficiently than a man in a van, map out flow lines and routes, measure up the contours, look for rogue emissions, check vegetation growth, and even penetrate soil depth to see what might lie beneath. Drones have already proven their value in emergency settings, going where no human can go, into fire settings, radioactive sites, and flooded areas. Drones are being pressed into services delivery systems, which could be quite valuable for moving urgently needed repair items quickly to hard-to-access sites. And at least one company in Calgary is developing a fully autonomous drill rig. Autonomous equipment is the way of the future. Next is additivity. An entrepreneur came to me recently with an innovative technology. He had designed a machine that could manufacture pipe from advanced materials. This innovation could eliminate the need to ship manufactured polyethylene pipe from factories somewhere in Asia to well sites in Canada, the United States, and Australia. Queensland, for instance, will eventually drill at least 30,000 wells, which will need up to 30,000 kilometers of flow lines, which is thousands of truckloads of pipe, not to mention acres of laydown yards. Additive manufacturing could reduce this to simply shipping the machine and the required raw materials. 3D printing could print replacement parts, such as gaskets and seals or broken pipe joints. Eventually, printing larger repair items will be feasible. Aircraft makers are already printing up some of the more challenging pieces of jet engines, so surely some of the parts in downhole pumps or drilling equipment will be printable. The U.S. Navy now has 3D printers on its aircraft carriers to print up spare parts rather than carrying the entire inventory of the ship 
uh, as a uh, consumable uh, inventory supply. The costs of additive manufacturing are tumbling to a point where the printers will be super affordable and easy to use, and they can be deployed virtually anywhere. Third is visibility. The Internet of Things is about making things visible on the Internet. Anyone who has set up a home computer network lately gets just how easy this is these days. We're enthusiastically connecting up all our toys to the net. Our cameras, our printers, our laptops, our mobile phones, tablets, stereo equipment, TVs, and appliances. The oil and gas industry is already expert at making its kit visible. Pipes, pumps, wellheads, flow lines, and other field assets all wire into central control rooms so technicians can monitor what's going on from one spot. But as technology costs come down, anything can become an addressable thing on the internet. All it needs is a power supply, a see either cheap batteries or a solar cell, an aerial, a chip for processing, a radio for transmitting and receiving, and maybe a screen for local interaction. And now that the big stuff in oil and gas is on the net, it's now time for the small stuff. The first use will be to just find stuff. The tool sheds and cribs, lay down yards and warehouses holding parts are so huge that finding things is difficult. Lots of company-owned stuff goes walkabout and needs to be replaced. Petty pilferage will disappear when the anti-theft features of mobile phones come to portable generators. The economics can be compelling. I helped a vehicle operator in Fort McMurray install these devices in their vehicles and eliminated the need for four people whose jobs were to just walk around and find misplaced vehicles. Imagine a day when every useful thing broadcasts its current condition state, its malfunctioning parts, its availability, and its available capacity, its quality measures, and is controllable by anywhere from uh, by anyone from anywhere with the, that authorization. Next is wearability or presence. Wearables are here, as watches, heart monitors, and Fitbits. Throw in an app store, developer kits, and the ability to integrate corporate systems, and we have the makings for a new range of productivity aids for the corporate workforce. Wearables are information delivery systems. Even the first generations of this kit are useful for dispatching instructions, short messages, maps and drawings, voice communications, and training. Virtually anything that can be digitized could be sent to a wearable device. The first application will be on safety to help keep track of people in the field and among the equipment, but soon workers using technology-equipped head, headgear or eyewear will be able to provide fully two-way communications to anyone anywhere. Imagine a field worker confronting an unfamiliar piece of kit, being able to call up diagrams, instructions, real-time peer coaching, and video chat with an expert. No more having to dispatch scarce engineering talent 400 kilometers to deal with a reluctant pipe pump. The junior guy can handle it. Next is shareability. Have you noticed the rise of the sharing economy? Using digital tools, maps, mobile devices, ubiquitous networks, search engines, and global markets, asset owners with underutilized assets are making them available for short-term rental. The best examples are Uber and Airbnb. Uber is disrupting the taxi trade, and Airbnb is taking a slice of the hotel market. Sure, sometimes the experience could be better, but in general, these services are growing because they fill a need. The oil and gas industry could be a big beneficiary of the sharing economy. There are plenty of assets that command high day rates and feature spotty utilization. Pockets of shortages and oversupply crop up regularly. Rigs, frack spreads, yellow goods, trailers, pumping units, and other specialized kit are effectively contracted using the same two models today invented by Moses. Sign up a long contract or haggle in the telephone bazaar for immediate use. Imagine the potential if an industrial buyer could gain immediate visibility to available equipment for prompt use. Work in the industry could be more fully optimized with benefits for both asset owners in form of higher utilization and customers, higher availability and shorter downtime on their assets. The mining industry has already moved in that direction with a service that rents out underused mining goods. Now, there's loads of other rapidly advancing technologies out there. Digital technologies, self-repairing equipment, artificial intelligence, advanced materials, nanotechnology, bioengineering, smart drilling, water filtration, waterless fracking. So, which ones are you watching with interest and why? You have been listening to a podcast from digitaloilgas.com. If you like what you've heard, please subscribe to future installments and visit us at digitaloilgas.com.